Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 136 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. There you go with your perfect intro. (laughs) You got to chip it up a little bit for me next week. You want me to change it up? I guess I could say the episode 136 after my name. I don't know. I'll work on it. I apologize. I will work on it. All right. All right. Just messing with you. So I can't believe it's November. What happened? Where was the summer? I'm not sure. I literally just said that. I was at my desk talking about the fact that today's the end of the month because we record this on Friday. And I'm like, where in the hell did October go? (laughs) Jeez. But yeah, it's rolling. Yeah, it's going through quick. Next thing you know, it'll be 2021. Hopefully a much better year for everybody. Hopefully. Couldn't get much worse. (laughs) That's true. So I don't know if you noticed, Barb, but they announced that Jim Glidewell actually has a book coming out on December 8th called Constant Change. Have you heard about this? No, but he's the constant change agent, so it's perfect title for him. But no, I haven't. You just told me. Yeah, so if you're interested in a story about a guy that runs one of the largest and probably most successful lab in the world, this should be an interesting read. I mean, no matter what you think about Glidewell, the dude's got something going over there. Oh, yeah. I'm hoping when he makes his book tour, we'll be one of his stops. Sweet. (laughs) So if you are interested, I'm going to go ahead and put the link to pre-order the book here on this episode's show notes. Nice. And if you want the audio version, I will read it to you. (laughs) For a small nominal fee. Of course, per word. (laughs) So over the years, labs have gone from all PFMs to Emacs to zirconia copings, and now we're on to monolithic zirconia. And it seems that zirconia is the number one restoration that most labs make. I mean, you would agree with that, Barb, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But one guy really didn't, well, a lot of guys really didn't like the way they looked. But one guy decided to do something about it. Don Cornell is not new to ceramics. For many years, he wrote articles and spoke to our industry about how to make a crown look better. To make it look like a more natural tooth. Then all of a sudden... We had Mio on our benches. I don't know if you remember, Bar, but like Chicago a few years ago, they first introduced it. And I remember talking to you. Is it Mio? Is it Mayo? Is <laughs> yeah, it? We didn't know what it was. That. Yeah. <laughs> I think we asked like three people we interviewed that day. But that's because Don Cornell at Jensen Dental knew there had to be a way to make a monolithic zirconia look better. So Don comes on to talk about his history, joining Jensen, coming up with the idea for a liquid ceramic and the people and processes that gave us the best thing to happen to zirconia since the hammer hit it. So join us as we chat with Don Cornell. Hey, Barbara, have you heard about Oradent and their new partnership? You mean up 3D, Elvis? Exactly. The new P5 milling machine by Up 3D. Is it another private label milling machine on the market? Actually, no. That's the cool thing. Up 3D actually manufactures their own mills. Wow, that's awesome. What is the P5 milling machine offering? Well, for starter, the P5 is a five-axis, efficient dry mill. Great for milling zirconia, PMMA, and wax. All right, so that's super ideal and totally convenient, but what about the quality of the milling? Well, it boasts software that produces high precision and fast milling. It can mill a crown, get this, in 14 minutes. And the tool life yields about 60 to 80 hours of quality restorations. Wow, that must be super expensive software. Do tell. Well, that's what's funny. The cam nasting software is included at no additional cost. Come on. That's a super great cost savings for any lab. Budget friendly without compromising any of the performance. All right, so let's talk about price. Well, the funny thing is it retails for only, now this is a number you don't hear about dental mills, 
$18,000. Wow, that's a super game changer for labs of all sizes, big and small. Under 20 k a small lab can now do their own milling instead of outsourcing, reducing their profits, which you know outsourcing does. That's quite impressive. Yeah, you know, if smaller labs can now compete in the CAD CAM race, it will help slow down the fast consolidation that has been happening in our industry for the last few years. I understand and totally agree for that smaller labs, but don't forget the medium and larger labs can benefit big time from this too. Well, of course. But also an- another great thing about the P5 from Up 3D is the two-year warranty. That spindle can last up to 20000 hours. That's a lot of hours, man. And of course, the Up 3D recently opened a home office in California near Oradent. So does that mean the mill ships from California and the remote technical support is also in California? Yes, Barbara, you are correct. All right. Obviously, <laughs> as always, they are both in the United States in Southern California. All right, so give it up. How do I get more info on the P5 milling machine? Well, it's pretty easy. All you got to do is call our friends over at Oradent. 1-800-422-7373. Or you can visit their website at Oradent.com. And Barbara, while you're giving them a call, go ahead and get me a mill too. At 18,000, I can do it. Get me three. Okay. (laughs) We appreciate your support of the podcast, Oradet. Thank you. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. We are excited to welcome to the podcast today a gentleman that his name's come up quite a few times on the podcast through various guests. And also, he's one of the creators of the Mio system, which we hear a lot about these days. We'd like to welcome Don Cornell. How are you, sir? Good, Elvis. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. It's a wonderful fall Friday here in Indiana, and we're excited to learn all about you. Yeah, for sure. Well, it'll be a very brief discussion then. If you can <laughs> well, we got to fill a whole episode here, Don, so <laughs> let's stretch it out. So, so, Don, tell us, your name comes up a lot. A lot of people reference you with teaching them how they got into ceramics. And how did you get into the industry? Yeah, I always thought I would end up in dental school. And when I was at USC, I had five roommates, two of them who were in dental school. And I was studying biology at the time. And one of the things that they talked about in terms of the difficulty of dental school, probably the hardest thing for all of them was the lab work that they had to do. So uh, I used to make my treks over to the dental school and work with them in the lab. I had high level of curiosity. When I was much younger in my mid-teens, I had had to have a crown that needed to be matched. And I ended up in a dental lab and spent half a day there while the technician tried to get everything squared away. And being a tinkerer myself, I spent more time plowing around through his lab and being told not to touch this. And not to touch that. <laughs> But, but um, you know, I was fascinated by it. You know, I was very interested in it. And, you know, I had an opportunity after leaving USC to spend six months in a, um, a dental technology program, which I thought, yeah, I'm sitting around here trying to figure out if I want to go to dental school and let me play around with this and see what that's all about. And I really enjoyed it and uh, met some very, very interesting people. Miles Goucher, who was the inventor of the Daner Articulator, and Peter K. Thomas Jr., some other folks that kind of got me really excited about the possibilities with dentistry and dental technology. And uh, so I, I graduated the six-month program in about a month and a half. <laughs> and really? Wow. So I was offered a, a position while I tried to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life in a laboratory in Fullerton, California, and I did that for about a year and then ended up in Northern California. And with one year of experience behind me, I was running a dental lab for... Wow. A uh, orthodontist had a string of offices in a restorative lab, and I didn't know anything about dental technology, really. I mean, other than what I learned in school, and I certainly didn't know how to run a lab, but I kind of got thrown into it as the least likely to blow the place up. So, (laughs) (laughs) good quality to have. (laughs) Yeah, I did that, and in a very short order, I had an opportunity to go see Willie Geller, who at that point in time was 
very much kind of exploding onto the scene internationally. And I went and saw Willie and uh, then started taking a train of classes from a bunch of other people. And I was really hooked and never looked back, as they say. No regret on not coming to dentist? I mean, dentistry has been really good to me, and, and I really enjoy doing what I'm doing. And I think it's a real career opportunity for people that, you know, you, you certainly can make a very good living with it. And like I said, it's been very good to me. So, no, I have no regrets whatsoever. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've been thoroughly enjoyed it all along the way. Nice. So I've seen you lecture many, many, many times. How did you uh, fall in love with teaching and lecturing? You know, it's funny. I it was probably about two years after I started taking my first courses. You know, I was minding my own business in a little dental lab in Northern California. And I had a pretty good relationship with a sales rep from Degusa by the name of Al Coda. And Al was always kind of dropping in and we'd talk and he was looking at what I was doing and he said, you know, I'd really love to get you in front of a few people and kind of just share what you're doing with them. And I'm like, shit, you know, I don't really, you know, I, don't really <laughs> I don't really have anything that I think would be of any importance to, that anybody really want to hear. So anyway, he conned me into going up to uh, the Reno meeting and I was sweating bullets. You know, I'd never lectured to anybody you know, had the good fortune of taking pictures of all the cases and stuff that I had done because I found that was a great way to learn, you know, to be able to mm -hmm. look back and see what you had done and make mental notes of that and, and keep adjusting your philosophy as you go forward. And, you know, I probably had an hour's worth of content. I wouldn't say it was great content, but it was content. And I put it together and I was supposed to speak twice, once at like nine o'clock in the morning. And I don't know if you know the Reno meeting, it's a relatively small meeting, probably get a couple hundred technicians. This was back in the uh, early 80s. So I gave my presentation uh, at nine o'clock that morning, to probably about 20 people in a room that held probably 70 people. Mm. I was like, Phew. you know what I mean? I was so excited <laughs> to have it over with. And I had to speak again at three o'clock. You know, it was funny because I walked into the room. Well, actually, I was walking up to the room and there were people coming out the door. And I couldn't get to the front of the room. There was probably a hundred and 25 people trying to get in. Wow. And I guess people said, oh, you got to go see this guy. And I was like, what are you guys, <laughs> what are you guys all doing here? And so, <laughs> you know, so it, you know, it was fun. And I, my style of teaching has always been not, I'm not really teaching, I guess. I'm, I'm more, I'm certainly aware of the mistakes I've made. And I try to share those with people along the way. And I'm still making them even after all these years. And I think most of the time when I'm presenting to people, I'm really sharing my experiences with them and I'm trying to draw their experiences out of them. I, you know, not every venue lends itself to you being interactive with the audience and having them participate. And, but whenever that's possible, that's probably my most favorite, you know, because mm -hmm. I feel like it's kind of an extended, you know, you're sitting around the uh, bar or sitting at your house with a couple of friends over a beer and you're talking about things and you know i enjoy that and so it's kind of a extended opportunity to do something like that but you know it's it's always been a part of my life i haven't done it as much as i used to do now that i'm older and i have grandkids and so i i do definitely enjoy my uh my private time now but you know when i feel like i have something to say that somebody might be interested in then i <laughs> then, <yeah. laughs> and spend a few minutes doing it. Awesome. So where are you at now? Do you have a lab? I still have a laboratory. By definition, it's a laboratory. It's, it okay. won't make a living from it. About 13 years ago, Dave Stein, the president of Jensen, reached out to me and he and I had been friends for a while. We, we share the same sickness, which is fishing. <laughs> A lot of people in this industry do. My children do. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we would be on these fishing trips and he'd be like, when are you, you know, when are you going to hang it up and come out to Connecticut and, and work with me here at Jensen? And, um, you know, we, we had that conversation several times over a period of probably three years. And 
I don't know if you're familiar, but I had a magazine. I had started a publishing company at that point in my life called Dental Dialogue. And I had yep. been running that for about six, seven years and then included an exhibit and a symposium and a lot of other things. And I guess at that point, I was just ready for a different challenge. And so I came here and uh, to Jensen in, in Connecticut and took up a position as uh, one of the company's vice presidents. And I've done a several different things, you know, while I've been here, not all of them well. I mean, they threw me <laughs> into the marketing department and I, I looked at Dave and I said, you know, I, I don't know the first thing about marketing. He goes, no, but you know a few things about dentistry. So why don't yep. you give it a run? And we've got some other folks there that can help you. And so I dabbled around in that for a while, probably for the last five or six years, I've been running the research and development department here. So I do that and I have a lab, which is great. It's a very synergistic thing because all this stuff I work with the uh, R&D team here on and all the projects we have, I get to play with them in my lab and, you know, look at, look at crowns and patients' mouths and kind of understand how things are working and if concepts are working the way you hope they are. And, uh, you know, Mio is a perfect example of that. Yeah. So how did that come about? I love the material personally. I use it in the laboratory. But yeah, tell us a little bit about that story because it's amazing. Well, thank you, Barb. I'll give you the long version. I think the background is, is important. It mm -hmm. certainly was for me. One of the benefits of kind of getting around and doing some of the things that I've done, I've worked with a lot of different companies over the years. I had a very long relationship with Ivacar and the development of the design ceramic. Mm. I was around when the very first Emacs crowns came out and or Emacs material came out. It was actually called Empress 2 at the time. Yep. Mm -hmm. it was one or two, I think there was two, maybe three ingots of basically really opaque, ugly framework material. <laughs> And, you know, obviously that product has evolved over the years. And But I was standing on a podium, actually, um, probably about 10 years ago. And Peter Peasy, that you brought Peter up, was actually on the podium with me. And this was right around the time that Glidewell was really making traction with the all monolithic, all zirconia bruxier crowns. Mm -hmm. For me, the most interesting thing about dental technology is trying to replicate natural teeth. And it's hard to do, and it's really hard to do it well. And that's what's kind of kept me going all these years is regardless of what you learn or how well you can do it, you're never as good as, you know, Mother Nature herself. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're always humbled by that. And we're standing on the podium, and Bruxier was kind of really taking the market by storm. And I was showing some crowns in the presentation. There was probably about 500 people in the audience. And I said, you know, there are a growing number of dentists in this country who think that this crown is good enough. Mm. You know, I mean, even uh, Jim Glidewell would tell you that Bruxier crowns were not they called them Bruxier for a reason, and it wasn't. They didn't call them beautiful. They called them. Yeah. They called them Bruxier. I mean, oh yeah. They refer to them as white gold. You know. Yeah. So did yeah. we. That's funny. I've never heard that, but that's how we sold it originally. Yeah. I, you know, they were bulletproof. Um, <laughs> they were white, and as long as you looked at them as though they were white gold, I think you were probably <laughs> pretty happy with it. If you thought they were a beautiful ceramic crown. Well, you were going to be very disappointed. Oh yeah. yeah. The interesting thing for me is I had been around a lot of behind the scenes with several different companies that were working on zirconia. And I brought Emacs up for a reason because, you know, we see how materials evolve relatively quickly in the dental space. And Emacs was a perfect example, right? From Empress 2 to Emacs was quite a leap in terms of aesthetics. And I had been to Fraunhofer Institute in Germany and 3M, Ivaclar, and several other companies, Amon Gierbach and, and many others. And I was privy to some of the technology and some of the developments that were taking place in Zirconia itself. And so I kind of saw what the future of zirconia was going to be. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty blown away, to be honest with you. And we were looking at Bruxier as kind of, this is the standard of monolithic zirconia. But based on what I had seen in development from several different 
companies, I knew that the future of monolithic zirconia was going to be something very different. Without disclosing any, uh, any secrets, I shared that with the people in the audience. I said, you may look at this today and think that it's ugly. Whether you decide to participate in these quote unquote good enough restorations is up to you. I certainly understand if you decide not to, Yeah. but I've seen some pretty amazing things. And I will tell you that these ugly ducklings will very soon be extraordinary restorations. And because the materials, the science behind the materials and the development is nothing short of amazing. You know, here we are today, 10 years later, and we have pre-shaded, multi-translucent opacity. I mean, you know, zirconia, monolithic zirconia today, all by itself, without any enhancement, looks pretty close in, in many uh, ways to an all-ceramic restoration. And, uh, you know, depending on the opacity that you choose. So probably three and a half years ago, four years ago, you know, I was sitting around with uh, the president of the company and he said, what do you think we can do here? And I said, well, I think there's a heck of an opportunity in the monolithic space because I see a future. And he and I shared the exact same vision. I said, you know, we both saw a future for monolithic that was bigger and brighter than for layering materials. At the time I gave the presentation 10 years ago, I think monolithic restorations were about 10% of the market. Today, they're about 95% of the market. Oh, yeah. Easy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I looked around and, and being a technician who loves to try to make crowns look like teeth, I looked around and said, well, I can't layer them, not in a monolithic space. We can do micro cutbacks and we can do a lot of different things. But if monolithic is really the future of dentistry, stain and glaze, you know, I, I looked very hard at that and it was clear we were never going to get there with stain and glaze. And we needed a completely different concept. So I, you know, Jensen owns a ceramic manufacturing company that they bought about 10 years ago. I packed my bag and I said, I'm going to go spend a week over in Europe and we're going to spend a little time playing around with the concept. And we came back a week later and, and I'll never forget on Monday morning, I walked in and oh, by the way, so I took James Choi with me. James uh, was I actually met James in California. He was working with Dr. Ed McLaren at the time at the Aesthetic Continuum. He was a mm -hmm. student there and then became an instructor there. And I had met James probably about three months prior to this first trip to work on Mio and uh, convinced him to come spend some time here in Connecticut. And he was crazy enough to say, I'm all in. And he and his wife came and moved here wow. and about a week, a week before or a week after he was supposed to arrive, I was going to go to Europe and uh, I called him on the phone. And I said, I know it's crazy timing, but you're not even going to be able to unpack your bags, but I'm going to go over to Europe. I've got a project I think you'll be interested in and you want to go. And he said, yeah. <laughs> and so he got here and literally he did not even unpack his bags. He just grabbed some stuff, threw it in a suitcase and off we went and I laid out the concept and we started in on it and we have some fantastic people over at Chemical, very talented and very dedicated folks who are really experts in ceramic manufacturing, in particular experts in the kind of ceramics that we needed for this project. Hmm. So we started and they all kind of looked at us like, I don't know what these guys are doing, but okay. And <laughs> we got about halfway through the week and we were working with some of the prototypes that we were putting together and the picture started to become very clear for everybody. And uh, we accomplished a tremendous amount actually in that first week, pretty much about 90% of the original kit was done except for the structure materials. All the colors were, were really done. And we had one structure prototype and we came back here. First thing Dave said to me was, well, what'd you do? What do you got? And I said, you know what? James and I would really like to put this together in a presentation format and share it with you in the right way. <laughs> so that Wednesday, we brought all the senior management of the company in and we gave them a, literally a little 15 minute presentation with photographs of crowns and things that we did. And we laid out the entire concept and there was dead silence in the room. <laughs> everybody kind of looked at everybody else and said, oh, this is going to be a lot of fun. 
Yeah, I mean, it, for, for me, I mean, the basic concept is really simple. It is a layering material in a jar, in a paste. You approach the application and the design of your restorations with that kind of in your mind. You understand how it works perfectly. I mean, you know, stains are stains, right? You've got about 80% pigment that's bound together by a little bit of ceramic powder just so that your pigments will stick to whatever it is you're trying to fire them to. Well, Mio was more like a, it is basically a paste form of layering ceramic. So if you look at your layering ceramics, it's 80%, 90% ceramic with a little bit of pigment, like a, a dentin material, for example. Mm -hmm. And we created the paste version of that. And there are different opacities and different translucencies. And when you use it the same way you would, you know, mentally build a, a layered restoration, it makes perfect sense to you. And, mm -hmm. and when you see the results, you're like, yeah, that's how my layering system worked. And the structure material was just really a recognition that with paste materials like this, you never can control surface texture. You know, you're putting in all these little details and designs and mamelons or whatever else you may want. You're going to need a, a second bite at the apple with respect to surface texture. So structure was a concept material for basically just creating surface texture over the top and controlling that the same way you would the surface of a, a layered ceramic crown. So, you know, people say, how long did it take you to come up with the idea? I said, well... Probably, let's see, I started dental technology in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm being funny, but I'm not, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, every, everything you do is the result of a lifelong experience, you know. So for me, the approach was crystal clear from the beginning, which is why I think it kind of came together so fast. So what's it like doing R&D with those kind of products? I mean, you're messing with hold time, temperature, heat rate, consistency. How did you guys finally know that you found the sweet spot in the uh, consistency of the product? Because, you know, you really have to dig in there with that knife or whatever you're using to mix it, you know, and it takes a while to get the consistency. And it's just amazing to me that of the concept and how it all goes together. And I was just curious, how, how do you get there? Yeah, Barb, that's a great question. And, you know, people sometimes, I think, you know, when you see Mio for the first time, you open the jar and you mix it up, right? You look at it and go, well, this is, this is a stain, right? And, <laughs> and no, and they say, well, it looks like a stain and I can paint it on like a stain. So, well, yeah, you can do those kinds of things. It's certainly a very good replacement for stain. If that's all you want to use it for, rock on because it absolutely works that way. But to your question, I mean, again, the idea here was layering material, right? And in a layering material, what do we do? You know, we build some dentin up and then if we're doing an anterior, for example, we may have to, we'll build up some enamel. And then on top of that, we've got to layer some mamelon materials. And then we got to cover all that with enamel. And there's multiple layers. There's a sandwiching that goes on of all the different materials. And, you know, those materials, as I said earlier, are different in you know, opacity and translucency and part Part of the three-dimensional effect that you get from a layered material is those differences in translucency and opacity. And people think that you can never get, you know, when people see Mio for the first time, they think, you well, you'll never ever get a vital looking restoration with that and because you don't have enough depth, right? It takes 1.5 mm -hmm. millimeters of layering material. You need that space. Otherwise, you can never get there. And that's true for layering materials. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true for layering materials, but it's not a universal truth for all materials. And the bigger issue it has nothing to do with the depth of the material. The, the critical issue is absorption and reflection of light and managing those light absorptions and reflections in the same manner as a layer material or more to the point in the same manner that natural teeth do. So when you can absorb and reflect the light in the right way, then your brain translates that as three-dimensional. So to come back to your question, Barb, I mean, this idea of being very efficient and being able to build a Mio crown the same way you would build a layered restoration, in other words, an all-in-one application, mm -hmm. really required very specific viscosities and very specific rheology of the material. Mm -hmm. And some people that look at it for the first time go, well, it's kind of, it, maybe it's a little too thick for a stain. I said, well, first of all, it's not a stain. And secondly, let me show you why you want to have that. You can 
easily thin it, you know, on your brush or whatever when you want to. But you definitely want to work with the viscosity that comes with it because it opens up all kinds of possibilities for you that you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. Ability to float one color on top of the wet surface of another without them mixing mm-hmm. is a very, very important and unique property that's based on the rheology of the material and the surface tension that creates and, you know, all those kind of things. So, I think what made it go so quickly was I knew exactly what I wanted the material to do and what it would have to do in order to work the way it needed to. The structure, on the other hand, was something I also understood what, but it took almost a year to actually make that work the way it needed to work. Very, very painful material to make. I love it. (laughs) I totally get it. You know, when you have that nice touch and you can actually flow the materials on top of each other and you're right, they don't mix. I mean, it's brilliant. You guys are talking some uh, ceramic porn here. (laughs) (laughs) I think we left Elvis on the curve over there, Barb. It's all good. I'm learning a lot and I'm trying to follow it. I imagine when you were making this product, you know, what you wanted and what science allowed you to do. Didn't you run into some roadblocks? Um, We ran into a lot of roadblocks, as I just mentioned. Take the structure, for example. Yeah. You know, the color, I'll come back to that in a minute, but um, the structure was a, a bit of a bugger. Because if you think about layering material, right, you're talking about a material that can be stacked like a layering material. You can shape it. You can do anything you want. I mean, you literally could build a crown with structure in the old fashioned way if you wanted to. Mm hmm. Not what I would recommend and certainly not what it was made for, but it has that kind of sculptability. Mm. The problem you have with layer materials, you fire them and all that structure stays there, right? That texture and whatever form you created will still be there, but it'll come out of the furnace in a bisque bake, right? It's not glazed. And Mm -hmm. well, you got to grind on it and then you got to run it up in the furnace again and either self-glaze or put a glaze over the surface. So... And then you've got glaze materials themselves, right? So glaze materials, you can't build anything with them. They just continue to slump down and flatten themselves out. But they certainly will fire to a nice, shiny finish. And so structure really was a hybrid material. It's it's in the middle of that. And it needed to be in the middle of that. It, It needed to give you the ability to sculpt something and create unbelievably small, like paracamata or whatever you wanted. And then when you fired it, it needed to fully glaze. And yet all that texture, all that surface, all that structure needed to stay there. And there wasn't any kind of material like that. And the window, in terms of making that combination of things work from a R&D perspective, was incredibly small. Mm. You're trying to really fit into a really small space. Yeah, sure. you think about it, you know, it's it's got to be glazed when it comes out of the furnace, but you have to keep all the texture and it's got to build like a layering material and it's got to do all those things. And you're like, okay, uh, that oh, product, yeah. product doesn't exist. So how are we going to get there? Yeah. What's the consistency of it when you guys put it on? Is it like a paste or is it like a Play-Doh or? It's probably closest to like um, a composite. Okay. Yeah. If you're familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah. So sort of gelish. I think your dough comparison would be much closer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I'm just trying to picture it. it. It must be stackable before you fire it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can. Non ceramic following along here. (laughs) You're doing good, Elvis. You're keeping (laughs) up. Yeah. But the color part of it, I wouldn't say any scientific issues we had to overcome. From a material development point of view, there were very specific rheologies we needed. Rheology is just how you put a, a liquid and a material together. And, you know, there was definitely a target that had the right surface tension. And also it was very important for a material like this, when you're working layer on top of layer, that things don't move around on you. And Barb would understand what I mean by that. Mm-hmm. When you normally use an, a stain and glaze, most of them are pretty runny. You know, after you put them on a crown, you put them on a peg, they can all end up at the margin. Yep. 
(laughs) or you tap them or you touch them and and they kind of everything kind of moves on you, you know, so Mm -hmm. that's called shear thinning. A lot of those materials are already pretty fluid, even without any kind of shear thinning force, like vibrating them. So, you, you know, you needed a material that when you tap it or vibrate it will flow. But the second you stop vibrating it, it freezes. It goes back to its inert Mm. state. And again, that's a really tiny, tiny window. So getting a material that will do that is important because when you want it to flow, you want to be able to tap it and make it flow. But when you're trying to layer a mammal on on top of a layer of smoke or storm or other colors you've already created and you've got your halo in there and you've got... Well, that's not a time when you want stuff moving around on you. So Mm. those materials had to be stable so that the colors didn't mix together unless you want them to, right? And then you can mechanically make that happen. So that was, again, was something that was a target. And it was something that fit into the entire philosophy of how some a technician would work with Mio and what the ability to float color on color. And then the other part of it was the what you see is what you get part. You know, that was also incredibly important as a ceramist for many years. I mean, you and Barb will, you know, can attest to this. You learn over the years when you're layering ceramic, if I take this color and that color and I put it on here and I fire it, I should, something should come out of the oven that looks kind of like this, you know? Mm. But you can't see it. And we've had lots of companies through the years that gave us these visualized liquids and some of these other things that if you mix your porcelain with them, you could see the more true color of the material. But most of them, you really couldn't fire it because it just turned opaque white. So it was another one of those things like, wouldn't it be really cool if as we're building the Mio crown, especially anteriors and things where you're putting in a lot of detail, whatever you saw, every detail, every color, every translucency, whatever you see is exactly what it's going to look like after it's fired so that you could have 100% confidence that you looked at that crown and you said, wow, I really like that. That's exactly what I was going for. You put it in the furnace, you fire it, it comes out, and that's what it looks like. So that's exactly what the company says, is that what goes in the oven comes out of the oven. And in my experience, it, that's exactly what it does. And I love that because I do use it for paracamata and mamelons. And sometimes when you're being creative, what goes in the oven doesn't always come out the same way. And And the beauty of this material is that it does. It's awesome. I love it. It it enables me to take a photograph, put it on my computer, and be able to add all of those intricate details. And when it fires, it's exactly what went in. So I just repeated myself, but I love it. Well, no, I I can hear your enthusiasm and it makes me happy, you know, because as a ceramist, I completely agree with you. That's why it was such a critical component of how the system had to work to be able to to see what you were doing and know that when it came out, it was going to look just like that. And, you know, to be able to stack color on top of color and not have them mixed together, that gives you the efficiency, right? Just like building a, a layered crown. You know, the other part of it from a science point of view is just how light works and how our brains work and our perceptions of depth and translucency. And, you know, what people, it's always funny as dental technologists, we've been trained through the years that vitality is a byproduct of depth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're almost like interchangeable words. And in reality, the depth certainly can play a role, but it's, it can also be a huge negative. I mean, how many times do you make a a crown and you got a lot of depth and you got a lot of enamel and you put it in the mouth and it's too low in value, right? What that, what's happening is you're not reflecting enough light. You're absorbing too much light. You know, I started a lecture um, in Chicago this year and I showed a picture of two central incisors. It was a upper anterior case, natural teeth. And I said, you know, what do you, what do you see when you look at this? And then I, I showed a picture looking up at the incisal edge of the two central incisors. And you saw immediately that number nine was a good millimeter to a millimeter and a half facial 
to number eight, mm -hmm. but you had no perception of that looking at the teeth head on. Oh. So this whole nonsense about, oh, well, you got to have a millimeter of depth of ceramic and all this other stuff, or it's not vital. Our ability to see that depth, to visualize that depth and, and to quantify that with our eyes, it doesn't exist. <laughs> You're kidding yourself. And you know, I did a lot of um, study and reading on how we begin to learn what depth is and, and what are the visual cues and the, you know, the mental triggers for that. And they're all the things that we really know, right? Bright things get our attention and they, they appear to be closer than things that aren't bright, right? Things that reflect a lot of light always appear closer than those things that absorb all the light. And when you start looking at that and you start going through some of the literature and the exercises, you begin to realize that that most of our understanding of depth and vitality and translucency is our brain translating what it sees. That was kind of baked into the cake. And as I said in the beginning, if you look at how a layering material works, you got opaque materials with lots of color in them, and you've got high translucent materials with no color in them. You've got this wonderful palette of different opacities, translucencies, and color saturations that start to move light around in a way that tells our brain there's a three-dimensional dynamic there that really doesn't exist, but our brain translates it that way. Crazy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Are you digging this, Elvis? I am. <laughs> it's fascinating to me. I guess I don't have that years of staining and glazing and building crowns, but it, it makes sense, and it's just... It's awesome. Yeah, it's funny. I early on when when Mio came out, and there's some people. Yeah, you know, the social media today is is a really cool thing, and you know you get to see people thinking in real time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes that's a good thing, and and sometimes uh, you know it's not. Sometimes good... you get real time opinions. So. Yeah, <laughs> you get real time opinions. And I remember we, you know, somebody in my generation and somebody I know and respect very well was looking at, you know, there's there's been a tremendous amount of buzz about Mio worldwide. And this individual came out and said, look, I don't care. You can never, ever make a monolithic restoration look like a tooth. The only way to get there is layered. And, you know, I respect this person very much, but mm -hmm. it's what that tells you is they, they understand what makes a layered restoration look vital that they absolutely get. And they're applying that same matrix to monolithic crowns and saying, well, I know I need this much space in order to make that crown look natural. So if I don't have that space, there's no way to get there. And they also look at something like Mio as a stain and they say, well, I know I could never get there with a stain, so I don't see how this can work. <laughs> and what's funny is, you know, you see... I don't know if you've ever been on the Mio users group. You should check it out. It's unbelievable. This is a, a guy, it has nothing to do with Jensen, uh, nothing to do with James and I. It just kind of, I think it was a guy up in Canada. Don't hold me to that, but a yeah. dental technician up in Canada who started it. It's a Facebook group. And within six months, there's like 10,000 people on this users group all over the world. And they're sharing their Mio cases. And I am completely humbled and blown away by what some of these people are doing and the artistic skills they have. And, you know, I see these pictures and I see the cases that they're doing. And, you know, we're talking in the mouth. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen some of the cases that James Choi and Jensen have published of cases in the mouth. Oh, yeah. I look at that and I think back to that comment on the social media and I think to myself, I couldn't imagine a better result with layered material or all ceramic or anything else. I mean, it is what it is. Yep. Agreed. So I'm curious as, again, the layman in this conversation, the shades that came out have some interesting names. It almost smoke. seems like <laughs> smoke, pumpkin, smoking, straw, <laughs> storm. I mean, it almost seems like a drink at Starbucks or something. <laughs> Why did you not go with, this is A2? Well, why the interesting naming? So there are elements of both. There are four colors that are 
really at the foundation of the Mio color system. That's the A, B, C, D shades. Mm -hmm. And those are the intrinsic hues that are found within each of those Vita Classic shade ranges, right? So if you have... Okay. If you have an A1 and you want to make it an A2, you put a little of the A shade on your A1 and, you know, your A2 or A3 or whatever you want to be. So there is that common connection. But having been in this field for a long time, you have two sets of colors, right? You have a set of colors like A1, A2, you know, A shade, B shade, those kinds of things that really require kind of that known reference point Yeah. as a ceramist, you know? You wouldn't want an A2 Denton called, you know, a passion fruit or something. <laughs> You'd want to know that I need an A2 Denton. So it's got to be called, it's got to be called A2, right? And so the ABCD shades, there wasn't a lot of flexibility there, right? Those are, yeah. those are your Denton materials. But when it came to the other colors, if you look historically, and, and I've been around long enough now and used a lot of different ceramic systems, you know, there's orange and yellow and there's blue. Yeah. And of course, when there's blue, there's blue one, blue two, blue three. There's dark blue. There's light blue. I mean, these names are in every system on the planet. And, you know, we kind of looked at it this way. I used the word I, but it really was we. It was not only James, but, you know, the marketing people and Amy, who you met earlier before we got started. Yeah. You know, it was very important to us to speak to, these are the colors that the artists are going to use. These are not, hey, I just want to match the shade guide. These are, no, I'm, I'm trying to make teeth here. You know, in our profession, there is certainly an artistic vein that kind of runs through that kind of thing. And Those kind um, of crazy people that we love. Yeah. I'm including myself in that, just saying. And I'm right there with you, Barb. So <laughs> we name them for life experiences, right? Like, I could say it's yellow, but it wouldn't really speak to you. But if I tell you it's straw, everybody knows what straw looks like. Oh. And it, it also gives you, it's familiar yeah. and it's something you know and you recognize and it has an emotional component to it. Oh. And storm, you know, it's dark and it's it's foreboding. And I don't have to tell you it's dark blue. It's storm. You know, it's dark blue. It's, yeah, it's I get you. gray yeah. and it's, you know... So we had fun with that, you know, and, and we wanted to speak to the artistic side of it and the emotional side of it. And because Mio is really all about all those things, it, it can replace your stain and glaze. Yep, it can do that. And that's very utilitarian and it's very functional. And the end result will blow your normal stain and glaze completely out of the water. Mm -hmm. But when you want to replace your layering, you're really into the artistry and so it was, you know, yeah, naming some of those other colors was really speaking to those demons, you know, <laughs> to the art demons. When you said that, like, I completely connected the two. Yeah. Similar to how Elvis felt about it, I was kind of like, huh, I wonder where they came up with these names. But now that you've explained it to me, it makes absolute perfect sense. Yeah. If I say to you it's orange, you, you're like, OK, what does that mean to me? It could be, you know, you and I know there are a thousand different shades of orange, but if I and tell you it's pumpkin, you know exactly what that color orange looks like. Interesting. That's genius, guys. Just saying. Your whole crew. That's that's awesome. Do you have any rejected names that you didn't use? <laughs> um, <laughs> probably calling them rejected names probably is the wrong way to look at it. Let's just say we've had a lot of fun coming up with names and we've thrown a lot of names up on the wall and had some, some really good laughs or you get the stink eye from somebody like really yeah. You know, yeah is that the best you could do so i you know i i wouldn't say we really rejected any but you know we certainly looked at a lot of possibilities sure when did you introduce the pink porcelain because i know we use that a lot here so that came pretty quickly. You know, as I get older, everything kind of seems to meld together time-wise. But it wasn't very long after Mio was on the market. And that happened pretty fast mm -hmm. from the time we developed it to the time it got launched. And it was very shortly after it was launched, I said, you know, we really need a tissue component to this. You know, I think there was a lot of debate internally from a company point of view. 
And I think the debate kind of went like this. It's, it's like, yeah, it's one of those things you really need when you need it, but how often do they really need it? You know, oh, how many technicians are really doing cases that require tissue? I said, look, ton. <laughs> I think it's more and more as these all on four cases, you know, hybrid cases continue to kind of blow up in the marketplace. And it, you know, like I said, it's, it's one of those things that when you need it, you need it. And it could be a single unit central with a little, you know, with big, huge bony defect and you got to put a little. Absolutely. You know, so, so we ran back and we spent a week and uh, we had a lot of help. I have to throw out big love to Luke Kasagawa. Luke is a phenomenal ceramic technician and does a lot of hybrid cases and his layered hybrid cases are absolutely amazing. And he spent quite a bit of time looking at tissue and ceramic and the, the lack of compatibility thereof and uh, came up with a lot of different formulas. And he came to James and I, one, uh, one Chicago, and he said, you know, I've got these colors and I don't know if you ever plan on doing anything with Mio tissue, but you might want to take a look at some of these. And James and I looked at each other because, of course, we were already we were already heading in that direction. Mm. So I would say some of his colors, not all, but certainly some of them were heavily influenced, some of the tissue colors. And then we, you know, we had a lot of others that we saw in nature that we thought were important to the kit. And it's still growing, you know. I mean, there's there's always something you realize you could use or you come up with an idea for something else. It was the same kind of experience, I will tell you, when we were developing the material and we were sitting there and it's okay, we need a color that looks like this. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I had the good fortune to be involved with material development early in my career, like the design ceramic with the Ivacar and things like that. So I understood the developmental space and I'd been in that space before. You know, it's a little bit like a kid in a candy store, you know, you're, yeah. you're a technician yeah. and you get to go open all the drawers and say, hey, why don't we put a little of this in here and that and then, uh, uh, you know, that's fun. I, that's, that's just pure fun. It's nothing more than, yeah, yeah, you're, you're trying to develop something, but it's just pure fun. Can't do. <laughs> I don't know, Barb, probably five or six colors together and wow. and we're just playing with it and just putting, throwing some color on a piece of zirconia. We looked at each other and, and I still have, we took a picture of the very first kind of just throwing some color on and we put some veins in it and all kinds of crazy stuff. And we took <laughs> a picture of it and we threw the picture up on the board and we looked at each other and I said, I could never do that in a million years with a layering material. Yep. Mm. And we we realized the, the power of of what of what we were involved with and came about pretty quickly. Yeah, I think when you go online and you look around and you see all these people from Spain and and Israel and and Germany and Italy and Japan just all over the world doing unbelievable cases and especially hybrid cases with tissue and you see the quality and the artistry and the, I mean, it's, it's, I'm completely floored. I'm completely floored by what they're doing. Oh, they're absolutely beautiful. I have a clinical question and I'm not sure you know the answer. We can edit it out. Yeah. Clinically when these crowns, if I were to put any of this material down by the gingival, does it photograph like x-ray wise as a ceramic? Yes. So if a doctor wanted a layer crown and, you know, I, um, you know, didn't want to layer it or I wanted it to appear <laughs> layered and I, it was a monolithic, but I put that down at the margin, it would photograph as if it was layered? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So it is a ceramic. The only difference you're going to run into is if you think about a, take an A1 Denton, for example, and you're building a layered zirconia crown. OK, yep. and mm -hmm. you would have about one millimeter, maybe let's say a millimeter or so of dentin material layered onto that crown. And after it was fired and ground and glazed, that you'd be probably somewhere in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, maybe less, but somewhere around there. With Mio, you're, you're 0.1, maybe 0.2 if you have structure over it. The pigment is more concentrated, you know, in, in order for that A3 to match an A3 dentin color in hue value and chroma and do it, that material you achieve that in one millimeter thickness. This one you achieve in a tenth of a millimeter of thickness. Obviously, the pigment concentrations are a little bit higher, but it is ceramic. So 
I can't tell you exactly what the radiograph would look like or if it would look different, but it, it would certainly, yeah, it's not, it's not opaque. Let's put awesome. That okay. I think I know what you're asking, Barb. And uh, when we used to do layered zirconia, you know, we would layer it with porcelain. And when we introduce Mio, we don't have to layer it with porcelain anymore. Exactly. And uh, yeah, we still charge for it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's where I, was going. I know what you're asking. We did the same thing. You know what? You brought up an, an, a really, I think, one of the most important discussion points in the entire program. And I say that because everywhere I go, and this is true in Europe too. So, just to give an example in Germany, they have the uh, dental insurance, and dental insurance will not pay for monolithic restorations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but every dental technician and every dental lab in Germany bills Mio crowns out as micro-layered. Okay. Ah, and there you go. It says, yep, it's micro-layered. All right. I say that, that's in Europe, but I think it's very important because a lot of labs in the United States struggle with how to position a meal crown financially in their laboratory. And, and part of that is carryover from where we started with zirconia monolithic restorations 10 years ago, remember? So we, yeah. we talked earlier about the Glidewell Bruxier crown, right? And Glidewell said, look, it ain't pretty. It's not the most expensive crown in my lab, but if you need a white gold crown, there you go. And yep. you can skip the gold fee, right? Just pay me what, I don't know, whatever, hundred bucks. And so monolithic zirconia kind of became the lowest priced offering in most labs. And that was okay when it was 5% or 10% of, of yeah. what you were doing. Today, it's almost exclusively what you do. And a lot of labs are trying to figure out, and they have really struggled with getting to the point where they can get back to... So if I had layered crowns, I charged 175 for, and I had monolithic zirconia, I charged 100 for, and now my whole lab's full of monolithic zirconia. Well, I'm not too happy about that if I'm still only yep. getting 100 bucks. Exactly. A lot of people ask me how I dealt with that and what do you recommend? And I tell everybody the same thing all the time. Dentists, I mean, sure, 10 years ago, give me that Bruxier crown, whatever. There was an expectation, right? That expectation is, I know it's not pretty, but it ain't going to break. And yeah. I'm willing to pay a hundred bucks for it. Okay, good. Everybody's happy. That works great. Yep. Now we're in a totally different space, right? And I tell people this, look, dentists don't pay for process. They pay for results. And if you use Mio and you understand how to use it and you use it and you, you make crowns, that rival the aesthetics, or in many cases, are better than what you got with your layered restorations, your dentist will be happy to pay your normal layered fee. And I have never, and, and every lab I've run into that has said, yeah, I'm going, uh, listen, and they struggled with that three, four years ago, but when you talk to them today, they were like, no, I, I get my normal crown fee. They don't bother me at all. They don't ask me any questions. Wow. Hmm. So I'll tell you this really very cool story, and I won't mention his name, but he was a, a dental technician, big fan of Mio. He had been using it, a small one-man lab, had been using it for about six months and was getting you know really better and better and better and had made a decision he was going to stop layering. And he thought, you know, look, the aesthetics of these crowns, I'm so happy with them and, and I'm so much more efficient and profitable. And I don't see that there is any drop off in the aesthetics. In fact, I feel better about these crowns than, than my layered. And he made the decision that he was going to stop layering restorations. And of course, he had no intention of telling his dentist. After about three weeks, he got a phone call. And it was the front office of his best dentist client. And this is a true story. And uh, the, the, she said, Dr. So-and-so would like to uh, know if you could come over at lunchtime. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Yeah, he, he would like to speak to you. And <laughs> okay, can I ask what it's about? Yeah, it's about your work the last three weeks. 
<laughs> and he was like, uh, okay. <laughs> so this was his best dentist client, the one that gave him the most amount of work. So he got there and it was lunchtime. There were no patients. And she took him to the back office, the doctor's private office, and went in and he took a seat. She shut the door and he was sitting there across the table from him and looking at him. And he was looking at him. He said, what have you been doing different to my crowns the last, I don't know, month or so? And he was like, uh, uh, and he goes, and before he could answer, the dentist said, look, I don't know you've been taking classes or what you've been doing, but these crowns have been beautiful. Awesome. And I just want to let you know how thrilled I am. Aw, that's a great story. <laughs> oh, absolutely true story. Absolutely yeah. true story. We all know that 90% of the time when a doctor calls and says, I want to talk about your work. Yeah, it's never it's a good, not never good. <laughs> It's never a good thing. And never actually, good. that was a customer who called here and talked to one of the uh, Jensen sales reps and said, I just got to tell you this story because Mio so is wonderful. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, hey, Don, we are well over an hour. That was great. Awesome. That's amazing. We might have to do a part two of it sometime down the line. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Elvis, thank you for the invitation. Barb, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, that was great. We learned a lot about Mio and Barb's Labs, my lab. We use it. We recommend it to everybody. It's good stuff. Well, thank you. Pre really appreciate that. Thanks again, Don. Thank appreciate you. It. You're welcome. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, Elvis. How is that Form Labs Form 3B printer going for you guys? It's still going really good. We are still cranking out models and custom trays on it. We love the ease of use. With the resin being loaded by cartridge and the free software that Nest and Ed supports instantly, it's pretty amazing. So you've been talking about it for at least two weeks now, and I think Night Dental needs to get some. Do you think that it could hold up with our workload? We've got probably two to 300 scans a day, and we're printing a lot of models. Wow, that many scans? That's pretty amazing. We don't even come close to that. But I feel that if you had enough of these printers, they could probably handle that high production. All right. But just a few weeks ago, they started shipping out their Form 3L printer. Wow, so they've got a 3B and now they've got a 3L? What do you know about it? Tell me about it. Well, with even a larger build plate, you can print a lot more models or surgical guides every day. And while the 3B that I have only has one laser, the Form 3L has two, so you can be even more productive. Sweet. And I was talking to somebody at Form Labs, and they are getting ready to come out with an orthodontic model resin that's going to significantly increase the print speed for those labs looking to get into clear aligners. Wow. All right, so that sounds like uh, what my lab is looking for. Can you go over with me one more time the website? Yeah, it's super easy. It's formlabs.com forward slash VFTB, like voices from the bench. Nice. Well, this will take you to a page where you can order a sample of something printed on a Form Labs Form 3B printer for free. This way you can hold the proof in your hand and see how amazing this printer is. All right, I'm going to do it. Thank you for your support of the podcast, Form Labs. We appreciate you. Oh, man, a big thanks to Don Cornell. I'm really sorry, Elvis, that we left you a lot of that conversation. Us ceramists are a unique breed that understand each other. And when we introduced Mio here at night, back actually when the furlough started was when I got the kid in here at night. So I was actually the one that headed up, was able to use it while, you know, it's kind of slowed down. It allowed yeah watch a lot of their webinars. They have a super training online, a lot of training, a lot of information. And I just fell in love with it. Super easy to use, but it's just amazing the things that you can do with it to make a tooth look natural, translucencies, crack lines. Oh, and the famous names of all of the materials, which we found out about on the podcast, which is pretty cool. I love it. I've told everybody I can talk to, make it your own. I made it my own. What's your percentage of crowns in your lab that get the Mio? Is it all of them? Everything. Yeah. No kidding. So from 
what March, April, May to now you've turned yep. your whole lab into all yep. those crazy amount of units you guys do everything yep. gets touched by me. That's insane. And then the ones that are, you know, the higher end the CAC product, which I head up that line, we use the structure and, you know, we do cutbacks and translucency, but I have eliminated a little bit of layering with that material and it's pretty remarkable. I love it. Yeah. So the higher end stuff, it's the one that gets the smoke in the storm and oh, the, yeah. All of those things that you love to say. Yeah. The salmon. <laughs> salmon. Well, thank you again, Don Cornell and Jensen, for giving us a much needed product in our industry. And of course, if you're interested, check out the links on this episode show notes for more information. Dun, dun, dun. All right, everybody. That's all we got for you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Good luck in the election. <laughs> You a funny man today. <laughs>